Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this episode, Scrabble obsessive Bill Nye is searching for his lost son in Sometimes Always Never. Years ago, whilst playing a knockoff version of Scrabble, Alan, played by Bill Nye, had a row with his son Michael, who stormed out and disappeared. Alan has been searching for him ever since, and now reunites with his remaining son, Peter, played by Sam Riley, to identify a body which may be Michael, and try and repair the damage to his family. When playing Scrabble online, Alan recognises a player's behaviours as similar to Michael's and arranges to meet with him. Sometimes Always Never is based off of the short story Triple Word School by Frank Cottrell. Boyce, who is an author and screenwriter who is adapting his own work for the screen here. You'll probably know some of his other film credits, including 24 Hour Party People, Goodbye Chris or Robin, and The Railway Man. And for this movie, he's routine with director Carl Hunter, and they previously worked together on the BBC film Grow Your Own, as well as doing several short films together. But Hunter's mostly known for his television work. And as you would expect from the plot synopsis, this is a movie about Scrabble. Kinda, sorta, not really. But even so, they did go to various Scrabble competitions for research. They wanted to get a sense of the psychology of someone that plays Scrabble competitively, like Alan does in this film. Speaking of Alan, you're probably wondering, what does sometimes always never actually mean? I'm presuming they chose that as the title because they couldn't use triple word score, they couldn't get the rights to it, and it's something that's very briefly brought up in the film. It's something that's used by tailors, of which Alan is one, to describe the correct way of wearing a three-button suit jacket. So you wear the top button sometimes, you know, in case it's cold, the middle button always to give it form, and you never ever button up the bottom one because it's functionally useless. It's purely decorative. And the same applies to a two-button jacket, in case you're wondering. Never ever do up the bottom button. And so that's something that we can all learn from, I think. However, I will say that some Sometimes Always Never is perhaps one of the oddest movies I have ever watched and reviewed online. This is a very weird little movie. The best way of describing it is idiosyncratic to say the least. It's almost worth comparing it to being like a British Wes Anderson flick in some ways. You can tell that he's one of the main inspirations here but I'm not sure if that quite does the movie justice. I'm not sure if that's strictly accurate, but you can tell that it's very detail-driven in the same way. In terms of its stylistic and visual approach, you can tell that everything in the movie has been meticulously considered. It's there for a reason. It's heightened to the point of artificiality in much the same way. A good example of this is the early driving sequences. You'll realize as they're talking, oh, behind them, that's rear projection. And that serves two distinct purposes. The first is that it amplifies the disconnect between the characters, and the second is that also it provides a throwback quality, and this movie has that in spades. In terms of its production design, a lot of the movie resembles that of the 70s in terms of its period, even though it's meant to be set in the present day. And maybe that's a little bit of a curious choice when you think about it. If the kid went missing 20 or 30 years ago, wouldn't that place that in the late 80s, early 90s in terms of aesthetic? Nevertheless, you can see it very prominently in regards to the B&B that they stay in in the first portion of the film, especially with the lamps and lighting in those sequences. It's got a very distinctive palette to it, and the movie is absolutely obsessed with its little knickknacks. It sort of builds itself out of bric-a-brac. Do you remember embossing labels? Those little punch-ins that you can put onto things and label them? Well, the movie sure does remember those, because that becomes a running thing all throughout the movie. There's also the fact the movie is very, very obsessed with knockoffs and pastiches. If you're the kind of person that has grown up with a Chad Valley football set instead of Subutio, you'll know exactly what this movie means. It's making a lot of references to things like that. Top of the Pops Pickwicks is a thing that is brought up in this film. If you don't know what those are, that was someone covering the top 40 pop hits 
at the time, but it was usually the same person just doing everything, that becomes a little bit of an oddball joke in the film. So I think with those descriptions, you get a sense of the quirkiness of the movie. And believe me, this film is quirky with a capital Q. And I guess for some people, this will work for them. It's definitely going to be a Marmite film. And speaking of Marmite, they bring that up as well. They mention how, oh, you can't import Marmite into Canada, and they explain the reason why. They have to sell the Vegemite, the imposter. It's not quite up to snuff. And so that becomes a running theme all throughout the movie. And in general, the movie definitely plays by its own distinct rules. It's a very slow, very delicately paced movie. Some would say almost sluggish in certain senses. It even does something that I've seen similar to a lot of Anderson knockoffs in that it has a very distinct three-act structure The chapters of the film are various dictionary definitions at the top of them, and it doesn't really have what you would describe as a plot. It really has three distinct episodes that are structured together. This is definitely a movie that you're going to have to be tuned into the right wavelength to properly enjoy it, otherwise you're just going to find it a slog, if not insufferable. And I normally like films like this. I like a lot of Wes Anderson's catalogue, but for maybe the first 30 to 40 minutes or so, I struggled to get a handle on Sometimes, Always, Never. In fact, during its very earliest scenes, I felt totally lost at sea with its pacing and rhythms. And that reminds me of another thing, because actually this movie has lo-fi animation in it to boot. There's a sequence in it where Alan goes out on his boat and it capsizes, and clearly they didn't have the money to stage that. This was shot on a shoestring, and I do think that informs some of the visual aesthetic. So the obvious compromise they came up with is we'll have this storybook style illustration of a boat going and then we'll cut right back into the action and there'll be two schools of thought on that one will think it's cute and charming and the other which i'm in will think man that's exactly what it is it's them trying to cover up the fact they couldn't afford to shoot that sequence and i spent more time fixated on the creative choices than I was the story a lot of the time. There's a lot of shots in this movie that are framed in a very peculiar way, where the actors are in the lower portion of the already quite wide and narrow frame. You get loads and loads of headroom above them, and I just wondered why? It just makes it look like it's perpetually misaligned. If it's a conscious creative choice, there needs to be some kind of purpose for it, and a lot of the time in this movie, I didn't feel like that was the case. It felt like style and deliberately kind of obtuse choices just for its own sake. I think it's a problem when a movie consciously goes for that instead of trying to facilitate the story it's trying to tell. It's not like the script is that bad? I actually think there's quite a lot of good here, but it's very hard to tell because the way that it's directed always kept me at a distance from it. I always felt like I was watching it at a remove. You never want to feel like that in a movie like this, and I know what it's trying to be. It's trying to have this lightweight, eccentric tone to combat the fact that the story that it's telling is in some ways quite dark and melancholic. It's balancing those two particular tones. I don't think it does a very good job of that. I didn't feel like I was emotionally invested, and for a comedy, I don't think I laughed all that often in it. If there was a thing keeping me invested in this, it was Bill Nye. This is the most Bill Nye part ever conceived, and I love him as an actor. And I can't think of anyone else who could have possibly played this. It was made with his foibles in mind. And Nye knows how to play comedy and drama. His performance does a better job of blending those two tones than the movie itself does. So when the film gives him a witty 
line, he delivers it with that signature deadpan subtlety, but he never loses sight of the sadness that underpins that character. And Alan, for all intents and purposes, his world stopped the second his son went out the door Everything since then has become this all-encompassing obsession with trying to track him down. And over the course of the movie, we realise just how deep that runs. Even the fact that he's playing Scrabble constantly on his phone, that's purely to try and find hints of where he may be. And there's a tragedy to that. There's a very distinctly bittersweet quality to this movie. It's not a mystery. It's a drama about the impact of loss on this family, about the void that has been left over the years and has grown and separated apart the family and so Alan has to deal with the fact that he's searching for someone that he may never find and may not want to be found in the first place. He will likely never know the answer to that question and he has to try and find a way of not letting it totally define his life. And Nye is terrific and he's also doing a really good accent. He's got this kind of Liverpudlian accent and sometimes Nye is a bit wobbly with those. His American accents in some films are really really kind of odd to say the least but here it works it genuinely does and a lot of the movie is a family drama in fact a lot of it is a bit of a two-hander with Sam Riley's character and there is this friction between them. Riley's got a lot of frustration bent towards his father because he's always felt second rate. That's where the idea of knockoffs come in because Alan, he was bereaved, he lost their mother, and so he had to step into the breach and he felt like a second rate parent and he was buying for them these cheap toys that made them also feel second rate and obviously the eventual argument that led to Michael's disappearance has clearly been something that had been building up over time that animosity and resentment had obviously been felt for quite some time and there is this sense that he's treating his remaining son like he's still a child which makes for some amusing moments there's a good gag fairly early on where he offers him the choice of electric toothbrush and they're both Doctor Who themed and that became the emotional of the film for me. I finally connected with it around the time of the second act where Alan moves into Peter's home and starts connecting with his family, especially with Peter's son. He moves into his bedroom, he gets him off of the computer, and there's a nicely played little subplot where Peter's son has a crush on a girl at a bus stop that he goes out of his way to see, and he turns to Alan for help, who in return smartens him up and gives him a message makeover. I was charmed by that, I will admit, even if his crush is barely even a character, but it only goes to show how much Nye is carrying this on his shoulders, and when he's not around, you can feel the movie deflating. This is most obviously seen around the time of the third segment, where he disappears for a good chunk of it, and Riley takes centre stage, and that character, you can tell it has a lot of bitterness there and so we don't gravitate towards him in the same way. I don't think that Riley's performance wins us over in quite the same way that Nye's does. You always find during that part of that film you're going, okay, when is Nye going to come back? Because that's when this movie is going to pick up again. It's very much a film that feels tailored for him. This movie has a very small cast, but also a very talented one, but they're not really given that much room to shine because unfortunately the supporting roles are fairly slim. Alice Lowe is a good example of this. She's best known for her offbeat projects like Prevenge and Sightseers, and it's nice to see her play a normal person for a change. It's fairly refreshing, but aside from that, she's pretty much playing Peter's wife, 
and that's about it. That describes the entirety of the role, and she is a really great comic performer, and you only get very brief glimpses of that when she teases her son about his crush, but that's a real waste and underutilization of her. You've got Jenny Agatha and Tim McKinney playing the proprietors of the B&B that they stay in during the first act of the film, and Alan challenges McKinney's character to a game of Scrabble, and it gets extremely competitive because money is on the table. He's not aware that Alan is fleecing him over the course of it, and then it's revealed something about these characters that someone call a massive coincidence incidents that felt extremely contrived to me but I could kind of go along with it to a certain extent but then these characters come back later in the movie and they really don't need to. Agatha for her credit does have the funniest moment in the film. That part really did have me laughing but aside from that these characters coming back in the third section of the movie did feel unwelcome. It felt like a distraction. The way those characters exit the movie is also a little bit embarrassing. I don't think that that joke entirely works unfortunately and then in a borderline cameo you've got comedian Alexi Sale if it weren't for the fact that he's billed on the poster somehow despite only having one scene which lasts all of about a minute tops why hire a name talent for such a tiny tiny role i get they're trying to make it an amusing moment but honestly you could have got the same thing from literally anyone being there and because these supporting roles are so thinly sketched and because the movie is so episodic and plodding it genuinely does feel quite directionless and by the time the ending rolls around even for a movie that is intentionally small scale it feels like the revelations are very very slight the overall message of the film is something along the lines of appreciate the little things that you have which is a nice sentiment but i wanted a bit more than that from a movie like this I wanted to like Sometimes Always Never, but instead I just found it trying. This really tested my patience, and clearly I wasn't the only one. I saw this at a public screening, and about a third of the audience walked out. That's seven or eight people, all around the 45 minute to an hour mark. They clearly gave this all the chances in the world, and this movie just wasn't satisfying them. And honestly, I was a little bit tempted by the same thought. But clearly there were people in our audience that were enjoying that movie. They were laughing along with it, even if I didn't share their enthusiasm a lot of the time. And there is things that work, mostly Bill Nye's performance. And so if what I've said about this film sounds intriguing to you, maybe give it a shot, but you definitely need to know that this is an acquired taste at best. Otherwise, I would steer clear of it, frankly. I don't think it has the right kind of emotional connection that I have to something like The Life Aquatic that deals with similar themes as this film. That movie makes me cry every time that I see it. This really felt like an endurance test at points, unfortunately. It's the kind of movie that looks like it should come together, but it never does. It's almost like when you're playing Scrabble and you've got an idea for a word in your head and then you look at your letters and you realise, oh, I don't have all the letters. This is that movie. Sometimes Always Never is a very peculiar film that feels extremely uneven in tone. What director Carl Hunter and writer Frank Cottrell Boyce are trying to do here is blend melancholic drama and quirky comedy, dealing with a sensitive subject matter with gentle humour, but the result is more irksome and sluggishly paced. The visual look of the film shows this conflict, appropriating a style similar to that of Wes Anderson, with a sense of deliberate artificiality in the staging and the episodic structure, but it ends up distancing the audience from the emotions of the drama and feels arch. Bill Nye is reliably brilliant as always in a role which fits him like one of his suits and he carries this movie, but Sam Riley, Jenny Agatha, Tim McKinney and Alice Lowe aren't given much to do by the script and ultimately the film feels quietly meandering and aimless in a way that eccentricity can't cover. If you like this review, then the word you're looking for is Patreon, where you can see my reviews early among other perks, including access to my Discord server. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out. thing you have to remember about these buttons is sometimes, always, never.